welcome to the final session of the day for StrimzyCon. So we have the final session for today is leveraging tiered storage in Strimzy operated Kafka. And we have Lishin Yao, Bo Gao, and Rashali Bo here to chat about that. So throughout the session, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and um, we should have some time at the end to ask some questions. So with that, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Li Xin Yao. I'm a software engineer at Apple. Uh, today, Bo, Rishali, and me will talk about our story of adopting tier storage feature in Streamsy operated Kafka at Apple. So here's a brief agenda of our talk today. Uh, we will start with some background and motivation on our architecture, why we are interested in tier storage feature. And then we will walk through our journey of integrating the tier storage feature and share some lessons learned during our integration. We will also talk about some number on performance benchmark and then share more about our team's contribution with the uh, Streamsy open source community. I will leave the rest of time for question and answer. Um, okay, uh, hand over to Vishali. Okay, thanks, Lucien. Um, this diagram here illustrates our typical ingestion pipeline for streaming applications. It showcases the flow of data from left to right. On the source side, we have data coming in from multiple sources, and that includes hardware devices as well as server side log events. This data is ingested through a gateway service. Gateway service acts as a crucial entry point into the ingestion pipeline. It performs several functions. It provides a security check by ensuring that only authorized data enters the pipeline. It verifies the integrity and quality of the incoming data. It also conducts schema validation by using schemas from the schema registry. And finally, it serializes the data by converting it into a format more suitable for Kafka consumption before writing it to Kafka. On the consumer side, um, Apache Flink is a widely adopted choice for streaming applications. Flink applications consume the serialized data from Kafka and use schemas from the schema registry to deserialize it accordingly. Following deserialization, Flink enriches the data with additional business logic, making it more valuable and contextually relevant. Next, please. Now let's take a closer look at the Kafka clusters in our ingestion pipeline. We use AWS EKS for all our, all our workloads, including Kafka. EKS gives us a standardized Kubernetes environment and makes it straightforward for us to install Kafka. To install Kafka, we use the Streamzy Kubernetes operator. We use Streamzy because it simplifies running Apache Kafka on clusters we manage Streamzy and Kafka deployments using Helm. For storage, we use EBS volumes. They have been reliable since day one, even though they are a bit expensive. Um, to expose the Kafka endpoint to external clients, we use Nginx ingress controller. Now, besides Kafka, we also use other tools from the Kafka ecosystem. We use Burrow for reporting lag metrics. We use Kafka Manager UI to give us an interactive view of the brokers and topic information. We also use Cruise Control for resource tracking and anomaly detection. This setup gives us a robust, scalable, and efficient data streaming architecture. Now, in our use cases, we often need to use multiple Kafka clusters for an ingestion pipeline. Each Kafka cluster has its own dedicated namespace but these clusters can be in the same EKS or in different EKS environments. We install one instance of StreamZ operator per EKS. This operator manages all the Kafka clusters within that EKS. The StreamZ operator watches all the namespaces in the same EKS and therefore allows us to streamline our operations. This deployment model has significantly reduced our overhead involved in managing Kafka clusters. Um, we have been running this Kafka architecture for quite a while now, and overall, it's been performing great. However, we have encountered some challenges, particularly around cost management. Initially, we used IO1 volumes, which delivered excellent performance, but they are, they are quite expensive. 
to save costs, we also experimented with GP3 volumes. While this helped, the costs were still high and became a significant concern. In some use cases, the concern was more than the others. For example, some applications require one week of data retention period. The associated costs with this can be prohibitive. And that's where the tiered storage feature comes in. It allows us to move large amounts of data from expensive storage like EBS volumes to more affordable options like S3. This shift addresses financial concerns, enabling us to offer longer retention times without breaking the bank. Performance-wise, moving data from moving data to remote storage hasn't caused significant issues. For most use cases where consumers need latest data, performance remains unaffected because the most recent data always stays on the broker disk and remote reads are quite in infrequent. Additionally, reducing local storage volumes has improved cluster reliability. Scaling the cluster for higher traffic is now easier either by adjusting retention times or adding more brokers. Broker startup time and application times have also improved. In addition to this, tiered storage has also reduced our operational overhead significantly. Previously, extending retention times during outages required temporarily expanding persistent volumes, and this is a non-reversible action. Post outage, we would need to migrate traffic back to a standard sized cluster which again is a complex process. With tiered storage, there is no, that is no longer necessary. We can adjust the total retention times without frequently altering local EBS volumes. This largely simplifies our operations and reduces overhead. To summarize, tiered storage has allowed us to ma manage costs effectively, improve performance, as well as streamline our operations. Over to Bo. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so let's um, uh, let's look at the journey of our tier storage integration timeline. So um, we have a brief timeline here for for that. We kick off our efforts with reaching out to Satish, who is the author of KIP four or five, um, starting from February twenty twenty three. We got a lot of help from Satish uh, to get the project bootstrapped with his uh, private um, dev branch uh, in two point eight. We also get a lot of help from Alan guys, uh, who is an um, engineering team trying to uh, actively working on open source their uh, remote storage plugins in S3. In the prototype phase uh, in April 2023, we were able to start 2.8 Kafka cluster with a remote storage layer on S3. Then we spent a lot of time on functional testing, performance tuning, and uh, other type of testing. We also built our own internal version of S3 remote plugin with some customization and optimization for our use case. Um, by September 2023, we were confident with the 2.8 dev branch uh, Kafka, and we consider it verified and ready to deploy. But it's still built upon a private dev branch and have some limited support from Kafka community. So um, we also noticed um, there are many new fixes and improvements merging to the trunk. Uh, in the past few months is. With that, um, we um, we only offer this version as a special uh, addition to our internal customers. Uh, in the meanwhile, Kafka 3.6 was also getting close to release. So we decided to take the trunk branch and then uh, take the 3.6 branch uh, for another round of testing. So the rationale is that even though 3.6 is not declared as production ready, uh, we can still get some basic functionality working and get active community support uh, since then if we find um, issues. Um, so besides tier storage feature, moving Kafka from 2.8 to 3.6 is also challenging. Um, there are uh, many incompatible uh, issues surfaced, which uh, we can talk about more, de uh, more in details later. Uh, but uh, uh, all in all, um, by November 2023, by November 2023, uh, we were able to sort out all kinds of challenges and verify 3.6 Kafka with our internal remote plugin uh, implementation. So we have since then gradually rolled out that version to our production um, smoothly since then. So um, looking a little bit uh, um, uh, down deeper down, uh, let's move on to talk about uh, some technical challenges. At the beginning, we decided to try the dev 2.0 branch Kafka. It's pretty challenging task because our team uh, doesn't have experience building Kafka and StreamZ. 
we were just uh, relying on public release, the StreamZ operator and the StreamZ Kafka image in deployment. Uh, fortunately, um, we can um, the, the documentation for StreamZ is really good. And uh, uh, with some trial and error, we were able to build StreamZ, including both the operator and the Kafka image. Um, another challenge we faced was that uh, uh, how can we uh, include the uh, remote plugin library into the StreamZ build Kafka image? The plugin library was not part of the Kafka repo. So it's not included in the tar file generated by Kafka build. Uh, we have two options. One is that uh, we could uh, customize the tar, uh, tar file in Kafka build and use a um, compose the tar file as input for Streamzy build. However, this option is not ideal because everything uh, we want to change, every time we want to change the uh, plugin library, we will need to rebuild Kafka and through the uh, rebuild Kafka and rebuild Streamzy, which is time consuming and error prone. So uh, the other approach we choose that is that uh, um, we, um, uh, we customize the Docker image directly with additional library for uh, remote uh, S3 plugins. This way works uh, because uh, it doesn't require the rebuild of StreamZ every time. Uh, we only make changes uh, to the remote plugin uh, library. So we have documented this instruction uh, as example in StreamZ proposal document for tier storage support. So um, the other one is that after we got a working image, we need to ensure all the new tier storage related configuration can be configured correctly and passed down to Kafka Broker. We were able to pass everything via Kafka config in StreamZ API. It's working, but not ideal. We have thereafter make a StreamZ proposal to support tier storage natively in StreamZ to simplify the configuration. And uh, um, we'll cover that uh, later. So um, in this tier storage feature, we need a plugin library for handling the remote storage metadata. We use a default implementation um, using a Kafka internal topic to store remote log metadata. The plugin comes with Kafka directly and is ready to use out of box. In the plugin implementation, a new internal Kafka client is created to read and write the internal topic. We need to configure the necessary configuration for this Kafka client and make sure its connection is secured. So after talking with the uh, uh, StreamZ owners, we, we decided to uh, use the internal client to talk to uh, 09, um, 9091 port, which is a reserved internal port exposed by StreamZ for inter-broker communication. Uh, the client can establish MTLS connection with Kafka broker using StreamZ created uh, key, a key store and passwords. So as mentioned before, uh, we have 2.8 dev branch working and verified, and we decided to explore 3.6 Kafka directly to ensure we are up to date with all the recent deployment work from the community. This requires us to visit, uh, to revisit our uh, build pipeline. First challenge is that we start to use Java 17 now for the build. Uh, so we need to experiment a much newer uh, StreamZ version 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.38 to fit the 3.6 Kafka version. The rebuilding process um, seems smooth, but we soon realize that uh, there's a new Kafka cluster is not able to establish a consumer SSL connection consistently. Um, with some of the digging into the StreamZ and Kafka release history, in, uh, in the brutal force style, we notice a suspicious issue in uh, StreamZ release node. So uh, related that is related with uh, ingress controller dependency version, which is caused by a slightly TLS behavior change in Java 17. Um, if you have also seen the similar issue, then uh, probably um, we can provide some of the information to save your time. So at this point, we're able to get the Kafka um, cluster startup and running healthy. However, there are still a lot of challenges uh, when enabling tier storage feature. Initially, we were, we were not able to get a consumer fetching from remote store consistently. Occasionally, the consumer could be stuck with no obvious reason. Uh, with some research, um, we find that the trick is that we need to tune the max fetch wait time to ensure the consumer have enough wait time to uh, wait for the um, remote, uh, remote store to get the data back. Um, this is because uh, remote fetch is happening. The broker side latency typically increase a little bit. Uh, so sometimes 
we got P99 latency for S3 uh, GET API uh, that could reach a very high number, like a few seconds. So uh, we need to increase this number and uh, instruct the Kafka client to wait a bit longer. After increasing the configuration value, we were able to get the consumer application running consistently. Um, another interesting configuration to consider tuning is the remote log reader threads and remote log manager uh, thread pool size. Um, it's kind of um, case by case varying uh, in our testing, uh, but uh, increasing the, the thread pool size um, and uh, the, um, uh, the, the reader threads, uh, we could see slightly performance uh, improvements. Um, the other one, uh, the other one configuration worth mentioning is the uh, uh, log segment size. Uh, so uh, the log segment size uh, decide the segment of file size um, saved in Kafka, and the, the file size will be uploaded uh, uploaded to remote storage and fetched down from there. So if that number is too small, you will end up with a lot of metadata uh, information and a lot of um, a lot of more um, S3 or like remote store fetch and upload. Uh, but with that number became too large, um, then uh, the payload will become very large, and then the S3 API call will have some latency, and that 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 have a latency implication as well. So let's go to the um, next slides. Okay, so at this point, we are able to achieve basic uploads and download. However, the performance is still not up to the expectation. Uh, we did some optim optimization in the uh, plugin library. So first one is we use a multi-part upload for upload paths. Um, so the multi-part uploads allow you to upload a single object uh, as a set of parts. So each part is um, uh, is uh, is a portion of the data, and you can upload these uh, object parts independently uh, without uh, without any order. And if the transmission of any parts fails, you can re-transmit uh, or you resubmit. Um, after all the parts um, has been uh, submitted uh, to the um, uh, to the remote, uh, you can uh, instruct uh, Amazon S3 to assemble these parts together uh, to create the uh, the original object which you are desired to upload. So in our case, uh, um, so in our case, this is a this is a perfect uh, case for for multi-part uploads. Um, second part is that we use the um, AWS S3 range fetch API. So um, the behavior comparison before is that instead uh, instead of a, a use a single thread fetching, you were able to uh, we were able to use a, a thread pool to parallel fetch, um, and speed up the fetching performance. And you don't need to um, fetch the entire thing if you only want a certain part of the uh, segments uh, to uh, to be fetched. So in our test, we enable this um, multi parts upload and uh, concurrent uh, range fetch. Uh, that improve our performance a lot uh, in terms of bytes in and bytes out. Uh, we observe the throughputs roughly five times um, uh, compared with before. So um, now we're in a relatively good state. The next step is to do the performance tune, uh, tuning. Uh, we're able to have a healthy Kafka running. Uh, we're able to perform remote fetch uh, and upload in the uh, in a decent performance. So we we spend some time to do the uh, testing uh, for various test cases. For example, what would happen when we have many consumer application consuming the same topic from the earliest offset altogether? Um, in our test case, we noticed that the broker could become very busy and cause interruption to other basic functionalities. Uh, so basically, you have a noisy neighbor. Uh, for example, the uh, Kafka producer client will start to experience very high latency, and the per broker bytes in may get impacted. So um, the remote upload functionality is also affected due to lack of CPU cycles. Um, to mitigate this issue, we choose to adjust the thread pool that fetch, uh, fetch, uh, fetch threads use uh, 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 from a cache thread pool to a fixed uh, thread pool. So the previous one, uh, the problem with uh, with the cached uh, thread pool is that uh, it will create um, up to maximum integer number of threads, as it always uh, spin up a new thread if the um, if there if there is a new ask. So, however, the fixed thread pool it will have a clear upper bound on the thread numbers to avoid exhausting all the CPU resources, so you don't become like the bad neighbor and uh, consume all the threads uh, which could be used uh, by the producer. Um, so the fixed thread pool have this um, uh, limitation that uh, 
uh, we only have certain number of threads to use. Uh, with some of the tuning, we we're able to find an acceptable solution for that. Um, another um, optimization uh, we use was that we choose to uh, create uh, two separate thread pool for the fetching logic and upload logic in the uh, remote storage manager. Initially, we mix, mix all the functionality with a single thread pool um, in the idea that uh, uh, both of that uh, resource could be shared for both fetching and upload. But, um, but then we realize um, they're affecting each other sometimes. So uh, to, uh, to provide a, a guaranteed upper bound um, or a lower bound of performance, uh, we separate them uh, so that uh, uh, the thread pool are managed separately and we're able to ensure separation of both of the function. So here I would like to uh, share some of the numbers uh, for benchmark proof, proof testing. In the test cases here, we set up Kafka cluster with six brokers. Um, um, each of them running 3.6 Kafka. We use StreamZ version uh, 0 0.38 to manage Kafka clusters. And each broker is running at uh, R5 and 4 large uh, EC2 AWS instance. Each instance have 16 CPU and 64 gig memory. We use this uh, perf2 provided by Kafka um, uh, for testing. For each of the topic, we set its partition number to 48. Um, and the replication factor S3. Um, the test case, in, during the test case, we force the consumers to fetch from the earliest offset. Um, so uh, in this case, um, we're gonna make sure that uh, um, all the consumer is triggering the remote fetch pass. So let's look at uh, the, um, the, the numbers. So the result, um, um, the key metrics we monitor is a per broker bytes in a bytes out. So that's what we highlight here in this table. Uh, here we compare three uh, different cases. First one, a single consumer and a single topic. With the given setup, we can achieve, um, I think it's 270 megabytes per second bytes out. Uh, this number is close to the perf we can achieve without um, any remote fetch. So it's uh, looking good. Uh, second one, we slightly add more consumers into that. Um, we don't see a lot of um, big change in the in the performance number, but slightly drops uh, because um, I think um, may, maybe the complexity of the uh, different consumers uh, have have some some implications. So um, uh, we see the similar performance at broker level, uh, but per broker consumer level uh, we see um, should be roughly around 80, uh, 80 um, megabytes per second to 100 um, megabytes per second. Uh, last one is that uh, we. Um, um, we uh, include more consumer groups and we bump the topic numbers to 400. Uh, so this time we can see increasing topic numbers could cause uh, implication on the performance. In our case, each consumer can get a bit less, uh, around uh, uh, 20 to 30 megabytes uh, bytes out. And uh, um, this, uh, this became a concern for our use case. Um, we, uh, you may want to do some additional tunings and optimizations to improve the perf for a larger amount of topics. I think the key uh, bottleneck here is mostly related on CPU. So when we are using a bigger um, uh, EC2 instance, then the, the bottleneck has been relieved and then we see a much big, bigger number as well. But um, that's, uh, that's, that's wrap up the, uh, the performance benchmarking for this. Okay, uh, now I would like to uh, move on and talk about some open source contribution we have made. Uh, like we mentioned before, we work closely with StreamZ uh, maintainers on a native tier story support proposal. So this is available after 0 0.40.0 release. Um, in this proposal, we are able to group all the tier storage related configuration into a dedicated tier storage spec and a Kafka spec. The user, users are able to specify the class information for the remote storage manager, as well as some additional configuration for remote storage manager. So the StreamZ implementation um, take the assumption that the uh, the remote log metadata manager will use the default option like what we do in uh, in what in what we'll talk about, which is a topic based remote log metadata manager class. So this configuration for remote log metadata manager class can be can be simply omitted, and the, those necessary configuration. And the, all the internal client configuration we talked about before 
will be automatically generated and passed to Kafka broker configuration by StreamZ cluster operator. For the configuration in the previous slides, this is the final configuration generated by StreamZ cluster operator. There are three sections generated. The first part is a LLMM config generated by StreamZ. So this contains the basic setup for the feature enablement and the RLM client configuration. The second part is remote storage manager configuration set by the operator and by the user. The additional configuration value, for example, the bucket name is placed here. Um, the third part is if there's any additional configuration for the custom IOM config, it will be placed here. So please note that um, the support in StreamZ is only for configuration. So to make the feature work, you still need to include a library dependency in the into the Kafka library, like uh, for example, using the approach we talked about before. Here is an example how we do this using the Docker. So we simply put the preview jar file into a dependency folder, and the folder path is predefined at the remote log storage manager class path. In this way, the Kafka can identify the plugin library class and execute the task. If you are interested to know more about the implementation or the proposal, you can find um, additional information in this reference link. So that's all I have prepared for the talk. Uh, I would like to take questions from audience. Thank you very much. Really interesting to see kind of the, the different levels. And then, yeah, great that we've got this now being contributed back into Strimsy as well. Um, we don't currently, I don't think, have any questions. Um, but I did have a question um, for all of you, which was um, in your experience of then engaging with the contributors, what, um, what would you recommend for people who were also interested? interested in contributing to Strimsy, what did you find were the kind of easiest ways to engage with the community and, and make progress? I, yeah, I, I, I want to call that I got really, really warm welcome uh, from the community, especially from uh, Jakub and Paulo. So they give us, they give our team very strong support and guidance on the implementation. So uh, I think it's, you no know, when we reach out, so um, I think the response and the, the, the level of support we get is, is really, really high. So um, yeah, I would say if, if other people want to contribute to StreamZ, you no, know, definitely reach out. And there are, from what I learned, there are some uh, open, open topics that uh, need help on implementation. Uh, and they also have some good idea on some known feature improvement we need to work on. So yeah, I, I think the level of support from maintainer is is a uh, is definitely exceed my expectation. So thank you, uh, Jacob and Paulo, for all the support. Yeah, based on my experience, it's also very responsive. Um, so um, it's it, it's really fast actually. The the response cycle once you reach out pretty much within a day or so, you're going to get some some response, and then there will be further instructions, and they will give you a lot of useful links uh, to follow up. <laughs> I think I think that's very responsive, which which is in, indeed surprising, surprisingly in a good way. Awesome. So yeah, if anyone does think of any other questions, then um, yeah, feel free to put them in the Q and A in the next few minutes. Also, all of our speakers are available as well in the Strimsy Slack channel, so you can go over there and ask them any questions as well. So yeah, thank you again um, for speaking today. Thank you, thank, thank you, you for hosting us. Uh, so with that, uh, that is actually the end of um, StrimsyCon. So the last thing that we wanted to do is say a massive thank you to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation for not only accepting Strimsy as an incubating project, but also helping us to host this event. We wouldn't be able to do it without them. They provided the whole platform for this. Um, so yeah, just a massive thank you to CNCF for uh, taking Strimsy in and helping us to run StrimsyCon as well.